And I feel like people who ship Endless Night are fired immediately and like <laughs> sued. It's like, yes, um, <laughs> that's very true. Although very true. the really bad version that is really funny to me and like a, in a version where this movie were just a joke, a complete joke, maybe it is, but we're not aware of it yet, is our main character calling her friend and whatever emotional reconciliation they have there. Yeah. Uh, the thing about stop trying to help me and just meet me where I am that breaks blinks turns something on in the engineer's head like of like meet me where I am we have to meet it where it is like and that's like yes. some code breakdown that uh, that we're not doing at all because it's so horrible it's like as if they wouldn't be going into the code where it is and trying to <laughs> that's all we have to do we go into the code and delete endless night <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Ryan. And I'm Seth. And welcome back to the Writer's Room Game Show. It's the podcast where normally, every week we generate an original feature film idea from scratch in under 60 minutes, working from a set of random prompts given to us by a big Hollywood studio. But this week, we're Ryan, doing what have you done? We're what doing have you something changed? a little different, Seth. We're doing something a little different. And actually, if you're listening to this episode now, it is vital that you actually have listened to a previous episode. I guess not vital. We could recap it here in this episode. People but. will die if you haven't listened <laughs> to Karma. So Karma, do which it is now. Uh, it would have been, I guess, now two weeks ago, if you're listening to this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two weeks ago, we released an episode called Karma. Seth, uh, explain the basic plot of Karma. Or should we recap this later? Uh, let's recap it now. Let's recap, let's recap it now. Yeah. Okay, so if you haven't seen the episode, we're still going to give you a recap, but you are required to stop this and go listen to it. It's great. Uh, we developed it for 45 minutes and then pitched it to wonderful comedian actress friend, Haley Alea Erickson. She's wonderful. gave some great notes that I think will actually help today's episode. But The premise of Karma, we, you know, I don't remember the specifics of the assignment. We actually ignored part of the assignment, if I remember correctly, but it was yeah, about- biopic. It ended up not being a biopic. It's about uh, a young woman who is, uh, whether we define it or not, as, you know, characteristics of being agoraphobic, being afraid to go outside. And she somehow, in ways that we hadn't really found or developed yet, but she uh, comes into possession of a, an a self-driving, self-driving car. car. Yeah, autonomous, yeah. an autonomous vehicle, mm-hmm. a car. F- discovers that it is a uh, worthy ve- a vessel that can take her out into the outside world safely without her having to interact with the outside world. And it's amazing and wonderful and brings her out into the world until it runs over a guy randomly. <laughs> and from there, hijinks ensue in a very, very strange, but surprisingly compelling story um, played so, out yeah. from those events. So yeah, that episode, oh, here's what we thought about. We have not gone, died into season three yet. We had a fun talk show last week and we think we're talking mm-hmm. about doing more regular talk shows. Yeah, whether, let us, please let us know either um, on our voicemail line, one 866 Hey, WRGS, please let us know either there or on social or somewhere uh, if you like those episodes, because we actually kind of like doing them. It's a little bit different uh, than our standard episodes, but we are curious to know if you like them. But the truth is, we don't care. We're going to do a few more of them, whether you like it or not. (laughs) It's Um, very true. Very true. (laughs) uh, Because we find them fun to do. And we're interesting people. Damn it. So uh, we want to have talk shows, too. We want to have talks. We want to talk to each other. We don't want to just work for you guys and dance. (laughs) So we thought, though, today we're going to try something. If it doesn't feel, it doesn't work, we'll never do this again. There have been a couple ideas in the past, Ryan, where Mm -hmm. we've thought, hey, I could pursue writing this actual in real oh, yeah. with real words mm-hmm. which I'm not using right now and how I'm <laughs> phrasing this sentence and we actually we also have ideas that we've been developing between the two of us off mic unrelated to the podcast and we've talked about how interesting it would be to have a podcast that potentially interesting to follow us developing said ideas and hearing the so actual so instead of a new idea every week it's the same idea developed further every week that was um, yeah. which would be a test of you know we're going to use <laughs> karma as a test oh I thought as, you meant would be a test of listeners patience <laughs> and <laughs> well, uh, I mean, if you like the episode, like a lot of our feedback for this episode is a lot of people have liked it. Um, so we're going to try it out and see if we could develop the story further. And if it's if we have fun and if it's enjoyable, we might revisit it, you know, on this podcast. Yeah. To- 
So just to be clear, we're not going to just be doing karma for the next several weeks. We decided this would be a good one to try out, like doing a follow-up or development episode. I don't like the word follow-up because it feels like we're clarifying and answering questions. Like I like the idea of maybe a development or something episode, like the idea of we're genuinely going to try and go deeper and further than we did on the original episode story-wise. Yes, karma. That's a French. That's a French tip. Oh, okay. So you don't say the X there, but you do say the V at the end of Denis Villeneuve. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. But uh, yeah, but before before we get into that, I know we did have, speaking of our voicemail line, we have a few voicemails for Karma to kind of start our show off, but we also had one for a previous episode we did called John Carpenter's The Computer War Jordans. Yeah. We actually uh, haven't listened to this, so it may not even be in the episode. So here we go. <laughs> this hear. is from Adele from Texas. Adele, oh, Adele does in. Texas Adele. <laughs> Hello. Adele from Texas here. Okay. So... I listened to John Carpenter's The Computer War Jordan weeks ago, and I told myself to let this go. Because that title is absolutely iconic. Recording but in progress. I gotta say, you guys, a Disney wild card involving robots to fit with Solo while Disney owns everything. Walt Disney's Pixar Studios made Wally, and your Solo sequel could have simultaneously been a Wally prequel. I don't know, guys, but it hmm. seems like a missed opportunity that I just can't let go. I mean, it could have been John Carpenter's dystopian Earth that led to Wally. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> okay, Texas Adele, that. your sign off is um, I like, really <laughs> solid. <laughs> Um, Texas Adele, I request that you call in every week because that was incredible. <laughs> and uh, sign off that and, way every week, and I, please. And I love the passion. Yes, and you must sign off by uh, by raging <laughs> um, every single time. That was awesome. Um, I think we might have talked about Wally when we were talking about the Disney properties, possibly. I don't remember um, it. It feels it feels so obvious, but also I tend to not listen to anybody else on the podcast when we're yeah. The, what a <laughs> <laughs> what uh i forget the corporation in wally that uh was creating all the, uh, the b and h no that's photography by and large b and l yeah, by and large yeah <laughs> what if it was b and h photo what if like <laughs> the b and h photo guys are like watching wally and just like oh we're the bad guys in this movie inexplicably oh, man. yeah but that could have been a fun like villain organization instead to have a b and b and l by and large yeah it could have been but, cool uh, I agree. So up next, thank you, Adele. Please call in again. Up next, we have uh, an old friend calling in about karma. Could it be LA Nick? I just want to call in because I really liked your idea uh, about your most recent, as I'm leaving this episode on karma. And I I had two um, little uh, additions that I wanted to drop in to help you. The first, I think I was wondering as you guys were pitching this, uh, you know, why does your protagonist uh, own a car, let alone a self-driving car, if she is agoraphobic? Excellent question. Um, yeah, that's and great. how can she afford such a car and such a lifestyle if she never works? Or maybe she does work from home. But I thought you could answer both of these and maybe the cause of her agoraphobia by stating at the very beginning that, you know, uh, maybe somebody she's loved, maybe a husband or sibling or, or a parent or something, was struck and killed by one of these cars or maybe an earlier iteration of these cars or maybe not even that sort of car that as part of the settlement she's uh, you know given uh, a, a lot of money to live off of and maybe they've even given her a newer version of the car that she never uses because of that and that's maybe why she doesn't like the car but when she's forced to get in it and uh, driving around she realizes it's kind of unlocked. so anyway that's that would be your opening. Very and then I thought another piece, you said that you didn't want the cars to be killing anybody. So maybe at some point, either when they reach the Grand Canyon or when the uh, Endless Night Protocol is initiated, maybe the car stops and says, uh, you know, you and the rest of the passengers have you know, 10 seconds or 20 seconds or whatever to get out of the car. But she, this, that maybe that's when she hits the, the guy and she's like, I, I can't get out of the car. Or, She's just scared to for whatever reason, or maybe it's further on down the road. And you're, you're okay, this is actually uh, similar to something I'm going to pitch you in a second. Telling us we need to get out, and she said, "No, I, I can't." Something like that. And so that's why they're still in the car, and maybe uh, the other people have gotten out of the car at that point. So that can either happen, you know, at your midpoint, or maybe in the third act as it reaches the Grand Canyon to pull people out of the car. I also love your jetpack idea where the cars just fly up, so nobody's actually killed. <laughs> but yeah, I, I really hope you guys make as it. you should, Ellie. Um, <laughs> 
and uh, I can't wait to see more of it. All right. Thanks, guys. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye, LA Nick. LA Nick, a pleasure as, as always. Some really interesting ideas in there. Well, and actually touched on two major things that I, uh, <laughs> I'll go ahead and give this away. Before we decided to record this episode, Polly and I were talking about developing karma like a little more. And I had a little more coffee than usual on like, <laughs> like one Saturday morning recently and like, like created an elaborate story clock that you'll probably get to look at in the video version of this podcast. Cause I'm sharing in our zoom. Can you see it Polly? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So like two things that LA Nick mentioned, the two things are two of the major things he mentioned. I talk a lot about in this and bring up questions about primarily being like, where does she get the car? And like, what her like home life, how she can afford it or what her home life is dictates, can actually dictate a lot about who she is and like where she is in life. And there's, a, mm-hmm. uh, we can talk about that as we go. The other thing is he talked about like everybody gets a chance to get out and she can't. I had actually thought up this idea of like a charge station that like the car has to stop and charge at the charging state. Like it doesn't know that it's a death trap. It's like time to, you know, pull over and go get charged at a charging station. You can get out you know, and get back in whenever you want. And then we'll continue our route to death in the Grand Canyon. Everyone else has figured this out and been getting out at that point, but she can't. It's a really good moment for her to have like, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. do I moment. So the point is, Nick, I thought of it before you did. And uh, <laughs> you think you're so smart. Uh, no, I, I do love, I love the idea that the car or the agoraphobia, the, the cause of it being tied to a relationship or something in the past that just something that we can sort of get to know her better by and uh, empathize with what she's going through. I really love the idea of that. Um, it's really nice. We, we had another note. Let's listen. Let's listen to our other voicemail on Karma before we uh, start to step in and, and uh, crank this thing out. Yeah, here we go. All right, Worthy and Polly, I just listened to Karma and I think it's like literally your best one yet but i had some notes or i guess like ideas the whole time Thank i was you. not in my head and i just came from my head so okay think about this karma summertime version think last man on earth except only a female lead she thinks think that it's the end of the world because the a in the car is like one of those moms that poison her kid uh, so it's kind of like night rider but kit has munchausen by proxy so it's almost like a grim and gritty Night Rider backdoor pilot where the Night Rider program gets mothballed and Kit has been kind of retired and Michael gifted it to his granddaughter. She's about to go away to college, but she's not going to take Kit with her. So she doesn't actually have agoraphobia, but the car starts making her think she did. So imagine this. We open with a long lens zoomed out into an abandoned parking lot. It's burnt out. It looks like it's the end of the world. Cam is doing a slow creep zoom in and a door, dra- door dash driver drops a bag on the curb and he walks away. And then way back in the background, we see Kit's bike turn on, and it just slowly, almost uncomfortably slowly, does this drive up. Cameron's doing a slow zoom in further and further. We hear the door open. It's focused right on the bag. Someone reaches out from the passenger side door, and it's an arm, like in an H-bag tube with a lawn gardening kind of glove duct tape, almost like you're a kid wearing a robot suit. It's all sealed up. It hesitates for a second. The hand kind of looks left, looks right, almost like it's alive or a puppet. Snatches the bag, and the car roars past Cameron with title card. So... I guess it's like, uh, we never see the outside world. So oh, wow. can control the tint of the windows. It says some kind of message like, the sun has gone nova, it will burn your retinas, something like that. But it turns out Kit becomes jealous of this door, da- door dash driver after the lead sees him over and over and for the first time sees his face. So Kit actually runs the door dash driver over, but it makes the lead think that maybe like she did it. So she actually feels kind of like contempt or jealousy or she's kind of worried something. She thinks she's the villain and that Kit is the one to protect her. At some point, she's got to get out of the car, and Kit does that whole, like, um, open the door and tell you to come in, but it scoots forward at the last second gag. So there's a little bit of humor here, but it is still kind of like she thinks that this is an apocalyptic hellscape. Um, at some point, she's got to get locked in the trunk with the door dash driver, too. They're in there for a while, and the kid has to eventually kind of convince her it's not a hellscape. It's not the apocalypse. This car is crazy. But when she finally busts out of the car, and after whatever kind of climax you get, when she finally gets out, she steps out, she realizes she takes her helmet off for the first time. The whole world actually has gone dark or something like that. There's no lights. It should be daytime and everything's pitch black. And it turns out Kit was actually trying to protect her. So it's more like 10 Cloverfield Lane, but by way of Night Rider, except for in the end title, it's not spelled Night, K-N-I-G-H-T. It's spelled Night, N-I-G-H-T, Night Rider. And we reboot the whole series and we go from there. What do you guys think? <laughs> I think I love you, Ryan Summers. Ryan Summers is uh, <laughs> could only be Ryan Summers. Pitches the like I bet you the Ryan has already animated. Call. 
animated oh, a title sequence 100%. and created a treatment for this. Ryan's pitched um, this to four studios already <laughs> with a full deck. That, that, that was a better pitch than we've ever had on the show. I applaud you, my friend. Uh, we are not going to go the way Official of Knight Rider. Official OWRGS um, applause. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> we will not be doing a Knight Rider uh, spinoff with uh, today's episode, but uh, I applaud all of all of your ideas. Well done. All right, so let's dive in. Yeah, do we want to do a quick recap? Or I mean, I'm assuming most people have have listened to the last episode by now if they made it this far. I mean, um, I'm really good at recaps. So based on our Indiana Jones episode, <laughs> yeah. I'm happy. Yeah, it only to. took about six hours. Only uh, took six hours. Longer than the actual movie that you're recapping. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was going to say, I would love to, I know there's some additions in this uh, story clock that we've made that are different than what we said on the episode. So maybe we just walk and uh, walk through what we have in plot order, and then we could kind of dive in. Because I know I would love to, based on just Haley's notes, uh, that her big note was our uh, character phone head. Uh, our protagonist not being a fully fledged character and that she was kind of uh, underbaked. Yeah. And uh, that's something I would love to work on is kind of finding who she is um, yeah. in this episode. In addition to, you know, some plot points uh, that we're making better and stuff. But yeah, I'd say we just walk through sort of what we have and then we can go from there. And this is one of the things where I've not done this enough to f- know how to fully dive into it, except I guess we, because there's a thousand questions that I feel like we have about our story that are unanswered. And then I don't want yeah. people to think, to think we haven't thought of yet. Like, but, you're right. It's narratively, let's start from the beginning. Like based on what we talked about in the episode, we talked about there being like in the first act establishing her. I'm going to keep saying agoraphobia, though I don't know if we will actually commit to that terminology because yeah. we haven't done a ton of research into what this actually looks like. Like, uh, yeah. so, but I'm going to say agoraphobia. I'm just saying this for the listeners. Like, I'm going to say that as a prox, as like as a placeholder right now for whatever she's, it is. She's we afraid of the outside world. She's afraid of the outside world for whatever reason we decide. So she has food delivered to her. She has like her groceries delivered to her and stuff. And we talked about having this Postmate that is always sitting at the top, like that, like this Postmate that regularly doesn't bring her food to the door or not regularly, but like we mm-hmm. see it happen in the first act once or like, or twice this Postmate like leaves the bag at the top of the driveway. And then she just has to leave it there because she can't go out and go get it. Um, and then whenever she gets this car, she uses the car, she ignores it. And I'm never going to use this car. I'm never going to go out, but she does use it when the Postmate like leaves the bag at the top of the driveway again. And she's really hungry. And so she tries using the car to go up up the driveway to get it and she gets it and it works and then we talked about her saying something that makes the car accidentally drive her to a restaurant yeah she well she puts on like a hazmat suit or like something where she can open the door quickly grab the food and get back in yeah and then she yeah. but then she says something that like it's like this moment of like wow that uh, this actually turned to be really useful this is great maybe she like eats it like in the car in her driveway and she's and she's like sitting under the sunlight or something okay we're now we're now i'm developing something but the idea is that she the car accidentally takes her to like a drive-in restaurant and it ends up being like eye-opening and awakening for her of like, oh my God, I can take this car. Beautiful drive on the way there. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so then we get this like montage of her, like this new world that she's in, this outside world and via this car. And we talked about this sequence being kind of like, you know, her, the movie, her with walking things, the idea of this like technology providing the, I, this like, idyllic music experience. playing as yeah. there's this like beautiful scenic views. She's like, okay. And like, this is, this is what our story is about. It's it's about her falling in love with this outside world. And, and being, then she runs over a guy. Then the car just <laughs> hits somebody. I cut you off on purpose because the idea is we'd want I, it I to feel, you okay, would. Would. we would want it to feel, <laughs> we want the like montage to hard stuff stop when she, when yep. the car runs over a guy and we also i also failed to mention you know what we developed uh, you know came up with last last time we can did. i okay yeah go 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 oh i was just gonna say this is kind of a development thing or something something i'm throwing in here i watch i've been watching we did uh we did like virtual sundance so i saw like seven movies this week so jealous of you while while my baby was sleeping and there's a movie that i watched called fresh where they dropped the title 30 minutes into the movie <laughs> and it was one of the best things i've ever seen and it was like basically right like the break into act two right when the story is really starting you want to do that here what yes it's like she hits the guy and then it's silent and then we just see karma pop up on the screen it's like holy shit and we have a title sequence as um she's trying to figure out you know it's it's going over the dead body it's i'm all for it quote unquote dead body anyways we're back i love it i'm all for it yeah i love it i'm also incredibly jealous of you and the weekend you've been having I can always I keep forgetting that I could do the Sundance virtual thing and then I don't do it. So hits a guy. And by the way, we've been over the course of this movie, like and up until now, even we have, mm-hmm. we, the car does occasionally as a joke, like it'll clip 
like mailboxes and stuff. Like it's not perfect the way that it drives. Yeah. There's and like we, a, there's an error in the software. We make a whole joke about yeah. it. And yeah. in the background, we're seeing all of this new, we're Which seeing. Which actually ha- is happening with Teslas. There, there's it like is. thousands upon thousands of Teslas being recalled because of. Well, they're not being uh, recalled because they're hitting things. I don't think. I think they're no, being. But it's, yeah. there's, there's a problem with the software and potential dangers, I guess yeah. is what you would say. So yeah, in the background of the story, we're, we don't ever meet anybody from this car company. We don't ever like see a shot of of this, like, you know, we don't see like, uh, you know, some newsreel montage or anything. We'll, we'll catch at the beginning or end of some scenes, like a screen in the background or, or nearby where, or hear people talking about like it, it, these, this car she has is in the news because in a bunch of these cars are out in the world. We see them out in the world, but there's like all of this controversy going on in the news about this car. And like you said, the recalls and the, whatever the, the software, and there's a new patch that's going to be coming out soon, etc. And we literally, if we're like watching it loosely, we might miss that and the story still works it just helps set up this. even like she's she's driving you know on the way to the drive-in at restaurant at the beginning or something we see a billboard that says something a digital billboard that says something about the recall exactly. different stuff like that where it's like you really have to be paying attention but once you know it's there you see it everywhere exactly that kind of thing so where we ended up where we last left off she we hit, hits the guy hits the guy with the car and she's on this back road and you know we sit in this moment like this is kind of you know we sit we, we this moment this movie has room to breathe and this is one of those moments where what does she do like she hit the guy and so she tells the car to go back the car backs up and i think runs over him again not like super violently like it's like you know just enough to where like we assume the guy is dead i just gave it away but she wills her so puts on this hazmat suit she has whatever it is and gets out and it's this intense scene of her trying to get him in the trunk and then as she's trying to get him in the trunk this car these headlights up at the end of the road she's on start coming up over the road and, and coming up like this car that's about to pass so she has to get get him into the trunk you so know, she, before she, this car comes. She pulls him out of the street just in time as the car shoo, yep. puts him in the trunk. And as she closes the trunk, the suit rips. The suit rips and then the car starts driving off without her. And so she's like running and yells and gets it to stop. And as she stops, another car is coming and there's all this tension. The point is she finally gets into the car and she's like, she did it, but she's like, the suit's ripped. She's like, what do I do with the body? The car hears her. The car hears her and takes what her to a cemetery. What do I do cemetery. with this dead body? <laughs> yeah. And the car takes her to a cemetery and she gets to the cemetery and then She's like, I don't know what to do. I can't do anything here. And then we hear a knock in the trunk and like a a banging in the trunk. And the guy is alive. And we talk about him managing to escape and he tries to run off or she lets him out but he starts he starts to run off she yeah, tells almost like the the she stops the car like hazmat suit on or maybe no didn't we say he got out of the car he while got she was out. still in it oh yeah and gets then, out while she's done it and he starts, <laughs> he starts crawling away right and he's like and he's like get that guy and he's like wait stop him like and she wants to take him to the hospital so she tells the car to get the guy and so the car he can't walk so he's crawling i think the car runs over him slowly again uh <laughs> because I like the I like the idea of him sort of limping and like trying to run and he's limping and then the car hit, that's when the car hits him that's when the again. car runs over him again and it's like <laughs> now oh my he god definitely can't walk and now he definitely can only crawl she we talk about she somehow convinces him tells him what's going and convinces him to get in the car I think it'd be funny to get him in the trunk to, she has to not only convince him to get, in the, to get in the car to get to the hospital but she convinces him to get in the trunk because she is scared to let so him good. into the main cabin yeah and then he can just kick his way into the main cabin because no, well, that's stupid <laughs> so while they're on their way to the hospital, the car then like changes its uh, its GPS like trajectory. It changes its route. Changes its route. It's now headed toward what it calls Endless Night. And it turns out we discover like they're like googling stuff and like trying to figure out why the car passed the hospital and where it's going and why it's going to the Grand Canyon. And it turns out there's some flaw in the software and uh, the firmware or whatever software update they released that is causing all of, all of these cars to now drive themselves to the Grand Canyon and presumably off the, you know, into the Grand Canyon. So the rest of the story was going to be about the two of them. How do they escape this car before it gets mm-hmm. to the Grand Canyon? Like, yeah, your classic, uh, uh, sort of, <laughs> as, well, I feel like there's a lot of movies where it's like, you're in a small space trying to figure out how to get out, uh, before you die. 
kind of thing. Yeah. But wrapped in that is sort of a she's scared story to actually about get their, out of their the relationship, car. her her sort of internal struggle trying to overcome, you know, personal things while he is also we forgot to say that he with uh, the story we came up with, he's this hiker that she hits and they sort of have opposing uh worldviews where she's like using this uh car that's like basically her her life revolves around the technology in her life. She's she stays home and on her phone and her computer all day and she's in this self driving car and he's this guy who does like he has a flip phone and he's out in the wilderness and he loves uh sort of uh, uh handmade things and like there's there's this these op- opposing views that creates a lot of fun contrast between the two characters so yeah. there's um obviously a lot of uh you know them seeing eye to eye is something that we would want by the end of the film as well as sort of a i, I don't know if that would be the i guess that'd be the b story the a story is uh, sort of the the plot of them getting out of the car yeah the b story is uh, the two of them i would say so like maybe let's start from the beginning of the story and kind of yeah. I can kind of present some of the stuff that I have like questions I have about it, stuff I've thought of and yeah. first act I don't know about you but I had in my head that she was in a really modern house like she totally. hasn't gone yeah, outside yeah. but so she lives in like I don't know why this is the movie I thought about the new Invisible Man movie with Elizabeth Moss oh, totally yeah, um, yeah. and I like it feeling very like near future where it's like yeah this sort of almost like a, an optimistic view of the future but also like terrible things are happening as well <laughs> like uh but the technology is like very like uh yeah like like that or her where it's her like, is the best yeah. reference to me because it's just this yeah, totally. war it's this it feels real the characters feel isolated and it feels kind of melancholy but it also feels very yeah. warm and bright yeah, at the totally. same time mm-hmm. yeah. um so but yeah i like that the idea of very contemporary house with lots of glass and sharp angles and stuff like that because if she, if she's gonna live like by herself like so mm-hmm. this brings up like one what that brings up like what does she do why is she ag- the questions are like why is she agoraphobic and i don't mean that like there has to be a reason but like does there need to be like is there a backstory was she always this way? Is there a backstory that's caused some trauma that's caused this event? Um, mm-hmm. What could tie into that is how does she get the car? She would not buy this car for herself unless she just saw the commercial and thought, I guess we want her to discover Unless she's it. just really rich and it's like, I, I need to, everybody has cars kind of like if she weren't like, but which I don't know if I like that. Outside, like, you know, like she's I don't in the think, tech world and all this stuff. Like, I don't know. You know I was wondering, yeah. it feels like something, someone would buy her and it makes me wonder if there's somebody who can buy it for her who bought her the hazmat suit it gives me an idea of like something if someone who keeps buying her things to help her get into the outside world that she has no uh intention of ever using you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, it, like, if that feels like an interesting Which dynamic. would be nice, too, honestly, because in our story, as it is now, there's two characters in the film. It's her and this hiker guy. Like, it'd be nice to have another force in her life that is this positive force that's trying to help her, uh, this supporting character that so either at least we, we, yeah. we've met or that we know th- via phone calls, like video calls and stuff like that. Yeah, because that, that's something that I, I feel like would help is having that reason. And that's a very natural way to do it, whether it's a family member or yeah. A close friend. Uh, well, so yeah. that, yeah, like a character that exists in her old world before she moves into the new world, like someone mm-hmm. from there that, and there's potential for them in the third act to come back. But like, so. Dude, what if they worked at the, the car company? Okay, that's interesting. Because I was going to say that's a huge financial gift to give someone. But it would mean this person is rich, which could help dictate to us what this relationship is and how it might play into her story. And, I, you know, I put in the hazmat suit. I keep putting hazmat suit in quotes in here because I can't decide if it's a makeshift hazmat suit or if it's some consumer grade one that her rich friend like gave to her i like the idea that this rich friend is like given her a series like, of things to try like and help it, her it's get a out. rich one but it almost by the time it rips like it's starting to look diy and sort of be yeah up because if she's out in the middle of the road maybe she falls it's all dirty and and uh has scratches on it and stuff like that but i like it looking very clean at the start you're yeah. right i like the idea of it being like like a piece of it or a glove of it or is or like the mat is all she has left by the end and she's using like you know, every little bit at the yeah, end, like yeah, somehow, yeah. okay, we can be, come back to what this friend is like. I kind of want to stay broad for a second and go through and talk yeah, about yeah. a couple of things, unless you want to like solve no, the no, entire no. first act. No, um, no. Let's continue. Yeah. So outside world montage, I wrote this and I'm not going to, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I'm going to read it. I feel like if she's going to get this outside, this is in the outside world montage, which mm-hmm. I have happening. So if you're looking at a clock, it's right after the three o'clock point, which if you're, just dividing up a story like uh, symmetrically and not really worrying too much about time, give or take, that's around the time the, f- the first act break happens. Yep. Um, 
And it makes sense that like in, a, being, in our four X structure. In our four, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, in our yeah. four X structure, but yeah, so our four X, we're dividing a clock into four pieces of a pie. In this second act, this is like you know what Blake Snyder and Save the Cat calls the fun and game section or the promise of the premise, or like you know in any story paradigm, this is where the main character has uh, stopped avoiding the new world of adventure and and accepted the call and gone into it. So we get this. Right at the top, we get this fun, what I call outside world montage of her like using a car, like driving, you know, seeing the world in the car. And I wrote this note, this comment, because I feel like if she's going to get this experience so early in the story, she needs to have a deeper want in the story. Otherwise, technically, this moment of her getting what she wants right before being confronted with what she needs would normally need to happen earlier in the first act or right before the midpoint, in which case she would run over the guy at the midpoint. I don't know if I understand what problem I had here. I do not know. I I mean, I get the I get the gist of it where we're seeing a glimpse of maybe solving this problem of for her it would be like getting her you know into the outside world if she's starting to fall in love with the outside world already but she's still in this car like yeah. if it's like if we're seeing that too soon it's almost like a we're faking them out where it's like oh yeah she might be falling in love with the outside world but she's still in this car and she still has to get out of this car and be yeah outside of this hazmat suit like there's like a there's a difference between her liking uh, a beautiful sunset and these beautiful locations and actually stepping out and being You're right. in the air and feeling that 100 percent feeling the breeze on your skin and all that kind of stuff there's a You're right it's almost like a, a tease of what's to come but it's not uh i don't think it's too soon okay so yeah i don't either now that i'm like objectively looking at it several days later so then she hits the guy and so this is going to be tough for uh without the visual for those who are listening but but I've talked about this a little bit in the past. I love and teach this in my classes, The what's called the sequence approach uh, from a book by Paul Giolino, where- Remember that one episode where you walked through all of this and <laughs> break then for we teaching, ended up cutting out half We of it. cut out <laughs> half of it because it went so long. And yet we kept my recap of Crystal Skull. Um, <laughs> So we divide a story in, in four acts. That's what Paul and I are doing here, just because we've kind of come to like doing that. Each of those four acts has two sequences. So a movie will have eight sequences in it, which are eight, essentially, you can kind of break them into eight short films with their own little beginning, middle, and end. But the end of each of them is a, uh, a directly leads to the beginning of the next sequence. So it's like these open-ended short films that directly cause and influence and, and relate to each other sequentially. There's it's kind of the structure in the first half of this uh, of in like the second act of this movie we're talking about that I think could continue for a little while like f- for as long as we want in the movie which is the sequence has its own little inciting incident it has kind of this new normalcy of the sequence so in this case the mm-hmm. outside world montage is like our new normalcy that we're opening the sequence hit with then she hits a guy and that's an inciting incident that like throws everything off and causes like a new wrinkle in the story and then the then you have this um, response this like confrontation uh, so think of it Ioko intention obstacle confrontation outcome so we have this like outside world montage hits a guy that's like the obstacle and then we have her confrontation how she relates how how she i'm sorry responds to that uh inciting incident uh by this uh, we want to drag out this suspenseful sequence of putting getting out putting the guy in the trunk the car starting to drive away without her all of that stuff the hazmat suit ripping she finally gets in the tension's relieved the car drives her to a cemetery and it's like kind of a comic relief from the tension that we've established and i thought then we have this little moment and then the the car is like uh five miles to nearest home depot to pick up shovels or whatever (laughs) right yes and it's like, wow, this car wants people dead. The So that's like, that's a sequence, by the way, is like open outside world montage, hits guy, sequence of putting, uh, like, you know, scene of putting guy in trunk and all of like the obstacles we put in her way with it and ends with the car driving her to a cemetery. That's the first sequence of act two. The second sequence is what I call like the guy alive sequence where the new normal that she's in, she's in like the cemetery parking lot or whatever and in the car and she's like, I don't know what to do now. And this is a moment where it'd be nice if it was some, there this meaningful moment somehow reveals part of her internal thread, that thing about her that we didn't have in our initial pitch, like whatever her mm-hmm. backstory is, whatever may related to the trauma of some kind that could led to this. And the inciting incident of this sequence is that guy is alive is like the sound of the guy in the trunk. And so the rest of this sequence would then be like, quote unquote, chasing guy down, trying to convince him to get into the trunk and getting him into the trunk mm-hmm. and then being on route to the hospital. And that's our midpoint. She's now uh, has a person in the car with her and they're out of the way to the hospital. And that's the midpoint. And that's the break into our third of four acts and into the next sequence. And this is where things are. I'm still not super clear on 
structure on if how much this structure is going to work. Like I thought maybe the next sequence after the midpoint could be endless night sequence. Like endless so our, night. our new normal of that sequence at the beginning is like has them in the car and like a failed, what I'm calling a failed conversation with the two of them where mm-hmm. she's not really open. He's not really open. They're not getting along obviously because he hit her with a car and it's all about the conflict and tension between the two of them. The inciting incident is that they pass the hospital and they're rerouted and the rest of this little sequence could be about them responding to and kind of investigating, figuring out what is going on with the car and the fact that all of their cars are headed there. I don't know what the actual goal of the sequence is besides investigation. That I figured the sequence after that could be a failed escape, could be the mm-hmm. charge station, the idea that... I love that idea. Yeah. And I'm thinking that new normal of the next sequence. So after the midpoint, it's endless night sequence and like endless night discovery sequence essentially. And then that next sequence after that is the failed escape sequence. And the new normal of that could be like, it could be a mirroring of that failed conversation between the two of them and toward the two of them after whatever they went through in the last sequence could now be in a place where guy opens up about his backstory in a way that could directly relate like relate to her and shed light which i think is probably going to come from him being a loner like because we talked about him being like a loner like dude like camping Mm -hmm. by himself and and then the charge station scene i originally had it where she he abandons her in that moment and then we have yeah, i'm hon- just thinking in his situation he's he's gonna go yeah like i imagine he would, we, some, somehow han solo and back into the story and you know the final the fourth act i don't but <laughs> we find, as all the cars are going off uh, he flies in an, an, another car pulls up right next door and it's him <laughs> Yeah, like uh, him driving a car. He's like, "Come on, jump in!" Oh my God, you actually. What if he, <laughs> dude? What if he hits her car? What if he drives his car in front of her car, or drives her car and like t bones it or whatever? Like, yeah, at, like yeah. that's actually. I don't know. That's an like idea. Like Last Jedi style. Uh, yes. Oh when, yeah, uh, that's Last Jedi. You're right. Yeah. Um, he's flying towards the thing. And, a part um, of me is like, what if instead of giving guys some tragic backstory, what if instead of that, we just give him the um, opposite emotional orientation as the rich friend in the first act? Like maybe the rich friend is always trying to get her to go outside and guy ends up being the first person who is willing to jump in the hole with her and try and help her get out together. Yeah. In that case, he wouldn't abandon her here. I he like ha- the idea. He would I like choose to stay. Yeah, and I like the idea of him. The thing that gets her out is someone willing to like come in and just be with her. Like, uh, yeah, she's obviously fearing something. Like, there's a reason why she's staying in this car. So at the end, when he has a maybe he gets out of the car and she's left alone, and ev- eventually there's some way that he gets back in the car with her, and it's like him choosing to, you know, we're in this together kind of thing. And she feels like I don't know that some sort of friendship, and he is what helps her. I don't know, like get out of the car. I don't know. I don't I don't know where I'm going with this, but no, I, I know. like that I, idea. I like it's the whole like the, the West Wing. Uh, did we talk about this? Did you watch West? What, what do you watch? Have you watched? I did West not Wing? watch. That's West okay. Wing, no, it's okay. You're a horrible person. I never want to speak to you again. <laughs> but no, I'm kidding. I just I'm very <laughs> excited for you actually that you get to someday discover that. Uh, it's a repeated story on the West Wing between two characters where a guy's walking along and he falls in a hole and he's stuck. First guy walks by. I'm, I'm butchering the story. First guy walks by, <laughs> throws him something. Second guy walks by, throws him something. The third guy walks by and jumps in. He says, what are you doing now? We're both stuck down here. He says, yeah, but I've been down here before and I know the way out. And in that story... It's That's related nice. to addiction and, tra- and trauma and yeah. uh, alcoholism. So like in this. And I just like the idea too of just like sometimes when you're sad or like feeling down, sometimes you don't want someone to like try to help you. Like you just want someone to sit with you or, or like be with you, you know, in that yeah. moment. And like and that, the, and that's kind of what it is for to me. To acknowledge like, your pain. And yes, to exactly. Like, and so I, that's where I kind of feel like what, like the friend then could at the beginning in the first act could be the well-intended, intended, like well-intentioned person of who was trying to fix her and our guy ends up being like the person who is willing to like sit in the weather. The question is how quickly do we want that? You know, because it's going to be very satisfying whenever he decides to stay with her. Do we want it? Is it more, more surprising if yeah. it happens in that moment or is it more surprising and satisfying if he I hits think, her car I don't later? think they're that close yet to where, uh, I think they've learned some from each other. And I think for, for me, it means more if he leaves and is given a chance to think about 
there, like think about her and come back and like. But I also don't want him to be the uh, like uh, the hero of the story, so to speak. No, totally. Like, I still it needs to be on her to make the decision to get out of the car, you know. But so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if this character, if guy would uh, like. I like him hitting her car, but again, it's like that. You don't want it that late in the game when it would end up happening. Like, yeah. You want. You're right. You want her to be the one who does this for herself. Maybe it's just, okay. This is the bad version. She gets out of the car. Mm-hmm. At, like she, sorry, at the charge station. She, which by the way, a charge station is if you're looking at a clock, it's like right below the nine o'clock mark. Like that's around the point where we're about to break into our final act. We have this whole like m- you know moment of like you know she has a limited amount of time to get out or and you know he's out and he's like he could run off but he's like trying to convince her to come out and get her to get out yeah. and she doesn't he could, maybe he we don't have to see maybe he doesn't even decide to run off before she gets stuck in there maybe he stays and tries to get her out until the car sh- shuts and drives off at which point he's left standing there maybe he just yeah. decides yeah, yeah, okay yeah. i'm out of here and leaves that's good because i like him trying yeah. like he gets out expecting her to just follow him and then he's like what are you doing like, and then we make know, a real meal. Around. That's the meal of yeah. that sequence is the two yeah. of them that arguing about getting out. Yeah. Then the car just, car door, it's goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> and so the bad version is the next sequence is all about her. Again, I'm, when I say willing herself out of this car, this is why I'm hesitant to say she's, you know, agoraphobic yeah. because I don't know anything about agoraphobia and I don't want to just assume that, you know, people could just my, do it if they try, go out if they my, tried harder. My struggle, my struggle with that though is now she's alone in this car and it's all internal stuff that she's unless she's talking to she the has car a phone and stuff. she can talk to the friend from the first act we're now in the final act and oftentimes f- this final act which i'm not saying third act or for- fourth act is confusing to people and third act is confusing this is normally what people refer to as the third <laughs> act is this section from like yeah. nine o'clock to twelve yeah, o'clock yeah. and this the new normal often is a return to the old world from the first act and so whether that be returning to certain characters or returning to actual physical space she could actually be interacting with a friend over phone or FaceTime or something who is going through their own experience with the car a- mm-hmm. as well. So that's a, that's one source of having of like you know having more than one person. That's one source of possible drama. But the best so the bad version I was going to pitch you is that she gets of like this. What, how does a guy come back into the story? Is if in this sequence G, which is you know right after nine o'clock, this is in the last two sequences of the movie. The second to last sequence is like her wi- getting her like willing herself out of the car on her own. And then somehow a guy tries, thinks he's saving her and gets in the car and she's not in it. So then the final act is her rescuing him from the car somehow. I, that That is a lot of choreography. And it's that's why I said the bad version. But I'm like, that's how we could possibly bring him that back. That is interesting. Yeah. You know? So she's already gotten out of a car. What if she stays in a car? Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm just no, no. I'm thinking of ideas now. She stays in the car and she talks to the friend, whatever. She's, all right, got to sneeze. Do it. Do it. Sneeze, 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 sneeze. It, it went away. It's right there. I think it's going away. <laughs> Just so the audience uh, knows, I got a soundboard, so yeah, I have one be now. Dangerous with that. <laughs> and it came with uh, sounds in it. Well, what I was thinking, yeah, if she's in a car and he is like, I'm going to be a hero. I'm going to save this girl. So he gets in another car. He somehow makes it into another car and it like pulls up next to her and he's like, I'm going to help you. And, but it, now he's trapped. Oh, because there's a bunch like, of empty cars like that would pull up to the charge station. Yes, or yes, people would hop out. Oh my God, he could get in another one. That's yes. brilliant. Paul. And now, now he's going to his death as well. And they can like talk through the cars like via, I don't know if there's some messaging. It could be like the cars. Yeah, it could be like blah, blah, uh, blah. Like some random name is calling you. It's just not who yes. that is. <laughs> yes but then it's like they're next to each other and she's like what the hell are you doing he's like i'm here to save you she's like i don't need you to save me now you're trapped too so she does it for him possibly like she actually saves the two of them somehow she she has to think of an idea uh, to get her out, but also like he is, she's doing it for him because she's like, there's no way I'm going to get out of this car, but I can still help him. But then she eventually gathers the courage or whatever. I don't want to say courage, but whatever it is to overcomes this, uh, this internal struggle to, to go to the outside world. But it's like, I like the idea of the two cars together, like next to each other. Like, why the hell did you get back in one of these cars? That's excellent. But to him, he's like, he wants to be like this hero um, and help her, but he realizes how dumb of an idea that was because he's in the same situation as her what um, if he rolls the window down his window down and like is able to knock on her window and like yes. points to like call like answer the freaking phone like we had like close with her and realize what's going <laughs> yes. on there and they talk 
And him having the, his window rolled down and like she, her, she won't roll hers down. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's a way when she decides to save the two of them, she knocks on his window. Like she rolls oh, her window yeah, down and actually knocks on that's his window. Good. Yeah. And cause that would be such a big moment. Just like, like with this entire movie, like rolling down a window would be like the biggest, most epic thing that she could do in yeah, this moment. It would. So like you frame it and shoot it. Like it's this huge thing, but it really just pressing the button and then rolling down the hand coming out. I, I love the idea, by the way, of the car. We got to find a way to make the cars fly in a way that <laughs> here's my reasons. Okay. As yeah. much as I love like the, the, the enterprise, the, you know, Star Trek and darkness shot you're talking about. That was really fun of like the car going down and then coming back up again, like is really funny to me. Yeah. What makes me laugh is the, after the triumph of that moment of like the car, like mm-hmm. flying up in the air, car or cars is it crashing back to the ground is really funny to me. <laughs> yes, um, yes. Here's the thing with the, with the dangers, like what we'd have to try and avoid if we did the flying car bit, which I think we should try for it because it's so absurd. And if we can set it up, <laughs> So it would, it would require setting up to not be completely outlandish. Like oh, yeah. whether that be characters talking about maybe the car can fly, maybe whatever, or maybe talking about how they could, enge- maybe they have, can engineer it to where it could fly. But in that case, they would have to be like, we in the audience, they in the audience would have to not know if it's going to work or not. Like you would have to feel like it's yeah. probably not going to work. Yeah. 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 The, the other danger is that the audience is going to call it. Like there's not going to be any tension because they're just going to assume this car is going to fly. You know what I mean? <laughs> You know what I mean? So it's like, it just truly surprised the audience. We can't set it up too much, but if we don't set it up, it's going to be completely unviable. Yeah, that's tough. It's not like that. There's going to be a software update and suddenly cars can fly. Like that's, that's a, that's a hardware thing. It's real funny, but we can't do it. Yeah. Well, unless it's like an Apollo 13 type thing where they've diverted, you know, they diverted power and energy from like resources from one, you know, area of the car. Like they've figured out a way to make jet boosters from the exhaust pipe. Yeah, like oh, oh, and like and like the fins we put or whatever like can turn into wings. I don't know, and that's also something that like the friend can coach her through, like the Apollo thirteen thing that she tries to do to her car. Oh, in case it in case it's good and it leaves, it's not going to be. But okay, nine o'clock mark, break into mm-hmm. Act Four. She's alone in the car. She couldn't get herself out of the charge station, so she's alone in the car. It's headed toward the Grand Canyon. She calls her friend. Yes, which I, I think they should work at the car company, but that's just me. Continue. No, no. I, okay, so I'm going with that idea that you. Okay. That you, okay. Yeah, that you had. I think it's a great idea. For whatever reason, they haven't been talking up to this point. Maybe they are now. Like we need to figure out some tension to like why they haven't been talking this whole time, or maybe maybe they have. But she chooses to like. Uh, she asks him, asks for help, which is always a good character thing. Asks friend for help. Friend walks her through the Apollo 13 like thing to do your car do this do that do this blah 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 she does it and maybe like it's a way to get the car to stop or get control of it but the idea is that she does it and right as she's about to do it like to get the car to stop whatever that's when guy pulls up next to her and <laughs> yes yeah, so you're like okay this is the solution and then that's when he yes. comes up and you're like oh shit <laughs> and so now she like tries to talk him through it but maybe the phone system because she diverted the energy from various places the phone goes system out. goes out <laughs> And so she like the can't electronics in that, in the screen or whatever. Yeah. Like and so she can't communicate to him how to do the process. Cause this and would all, Oh, this would all be electric. That's the whole it's thing. All electric. These cars it's, would be electric. And it's all happening while the cars are moving <laughs> fast too. So like, yes, that's when she has to choose to roll her window down to like, to help him. And maybe she pulls him into that. Which car. at this point we're sort of in our fourth quadrant. Yes, That's, uh, our final, co- yeah, yeah our, our, we're, our final quadrant. Oh, we're all ho- we've been in our fourth con- quadrant with what I've been talking about with the sorry, car. Sorry, I meant the, uh, the 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 eighth sequence. Yeah, sequence. Acts sorry, and sequences. I'm no, sorry. Blanking. Movie breaks down to acts. Acts break into sequences. Sequences yep. break into scenes. Scenes break into shots, and so on. It's what not do that, shots break into? It's not that simple. Shots break into frames. Um, frames break into pixels. Pixels nailed it. Pixels break <laughs> into uh, human Data? emotions. Um, truth. <laughs> yes, I I kind of love that because now. It requires her. The only way that she would ever help this guy is if she overcomes this internal struggle with with herself. But then, she, then they have to actually do the thing where they're uh, fixing. Like that, that's the thing now. If if the solution was to break, um, and she has her car now has the ability to do that, it would. She would have to get that for his car. 
maybe something goes wrong when he's trying to override the system or whatever. Well, it's also and that so she that can't, he, he has to jump into her, her car. Or yeah, she can She also just yeah. like can't. I think we put it to where she can't even communicate. Dude, what if he has to jump into the trunk at the end? To, to, oh, perfect. Like he, he, he has perfect. to get back into the trunk. He's like, damn it. That's and that way we can once it perfect. once it stops, he can say you know like a one liner where it's like back here again. That's uh, so perfect. So perfect. <laughs> what I was gonna say, like I don't think she even gets to tell him the solution i think her solution doesn't break it's that her method her way to communicate the solution to him breaks like the phone system or something in the car breaks yeah yeah and so now she's going to be fine if she just pushes the button or whatever yeah but he'll be but he she has no way to tell it to him and so that's what makes her roll the window down and tell him so the trick is then how do we make you know you want him to get in her car even when it's doomed or something like I still feel like we want. Well, he did that. He did that by getting in the car and driving out. So never mind. Yeah, yeah. I think so, now it's like her being the hero, a hundred percent, and him being the damsel. Yeah, I think for me, like it would be interesting too if she if he does roll his window down and she walks and starts to walk him through, and then something goes wrong with his car, or it's like something specific to her model of vehicle, so that he's not able to do it and he has to get back into the car with her. Like the only way for him to be saved is for him to jump over to the car or something that happened like that to where he has to yet again get back in her car. Yeah. Uh, for the third time. So then why does it go off the cliff and then fly? Like he gets in. <laughs> that's where you want to. She that's pushes where you the button and then it doesn't work. Like. And then it's Toy Story 3 style as they. Hold their hands. They, yeah. They, they, they 100%. Hold hands that they fly off the cliff. But yeah. I, I have no idea how this. These electric cars are supposed to fly, Seth. We need to bring in uh, Mr. Josh Cooley to figure this out. Well, here's the thing. Toy Story 3 works because it's funny, it's satisfying, and because the character's yeah. growth was how, not... How do they get out of this? Uh, how, do the, how do that? Don't they... Uh... You don't remember? It was the aliens used the giant claw yes, I, yes, to that's right, that's right. pull them out. Which is so good. The and claw. it's you could argue it's deus ex machina, but it's not... But the reason it, it's okay, I think, in that situation, because it doesn't inhibit the character's growth. Like yeah. a Deus Ex Machina like feels like a cheat and doesn't feel satisfying normally because it doesn't require anything of our characters. If you didn't have the characters arriving at like as long as we have each other, we're gonna be fine and, and holding their hands like we've lived a good life kind of thing. Yes. Like if you didn't have that, it would it wouldn't work. But because the, the ending, characters grew in that moment. Yes. The okay. ending still so, took everything and required everything of our characters. And so yeah. it felt satisfying. So I think, I wonder if we can get away with the company like releasing a software update right then that makes it fly or something <laughs> yes, like that. Or, and then, yes, and as it flies off, you have the friend on the phone like, I knew this could work. I knew it could work. And I then it just <laughs> <laughs> into the ground like hard, like like a wide shot of it just like, you know, f- cr- like Dude, almost falling, hitting the ground. This And this might be a little plot convenient. It might be a little weird if the friend is a developer or within this or like someone who's working on like the update at the car company. It, it seems v- way too convenient, but uh, they're part of the like. It's not convenient. That's how she has the car. Like, yeah, but th- but that the friend's software update is what is effing up all these cars and they're having to solve like, oh shit, like endless night that like this was not supposed to happen. So this friend the whole time is trying to solve the problem of this update and maybe uh, in the background. So when she calls her in the the uh, the seventh sequence and she's like, I th- the, uh, this is the best way that you're going to overcome like the protocol. You just do this and that and uh, you'll be able to break. If the simultaneously that the, the character is working on a way to make the cars fly, it's <laughs> they can <laughs> well, uh, won't fly. Like I don't. I, I, don't I also. Know, so. I also feel like that also leads to like the bad. Like one, how does she have time to talk to her friend and work through stuff if she's the one fixing yes, everything? Trying to figure out endless night. Yeah, and I feel like people who ship endless night are fired immediately and like <laughs> sued. It's like yes, um, <laughs> that's very true. Although very true. the really bad version that is really funny to me and like a, in a version where this movie were just a joke, a complete joke. Maybe it is, but we're not aware of it yet is our main character calling her friend and whatever emotional reconciliation they have there. Yeah. Uh, the thing about stop trying to help me and just meet me where I am that breaks that like blinks, turns something on in the engineer's head. Like of like, meet me where I am. We have to meet it where it is. Like, and that's like <laughs> <Yes>. some <laughs> code breakdown that, uh, that we're not doing at all. Cause it's so horrible. It's like as if they wouldn't be going into the code where it is and trying to, <laughs> That's all we have to do. We go into the code and delete endless night. 
<laughs> oh man that's, that's so, so funny though because it, it's always like one phrase that they like get attached to it's like that's it <laughs> yep it's a in independence day it's literally get off the floor you're gonna catch a cold like that's it you're gonna catch a cold Freaking, yes and, that's say, what, and he's like goldblum. what did you say say that again i'm jeff goldblum <laughs> This is my incredible uh, Jeff Goldblum impression. I love his dad in that movie. It's uh, too good. Yes. Which that's one of my favorite uh, plot device research uh, logs we've ever done. Mostly because I did that and then I sent it to you and you punched it up with some of the funniest like jokes I've seen on that website. That was the most fun um, I've ever had punching something up because you had such okay. a great base for it. And it was like. Because it was like someone who has. I hadn't watched that movie in like seven, eight years. And I like, watched it like a, the day before. <laughs> <laughs> yes and and you're just a, like a way bigger fan of that movie and are more familiar with it so you were able to like take what i wrote as a uh anyways we're getting <laughs> off track it was it was everyone should go check so it out great plot devices. Yes. co uh go to the uh, blog and look yes, for the, the independence, uh, independence day research log i think it's yes. some of our finest writing we've ever done i, I agree <laughs> Seth, we've been going for about an hour, so I think we should. Yeah, we got a uh, break. That's a good place, you know. Re- and I think, honestly, I I don't care if people uh, didn't enjoy this or not. I think we should uh, revisit this again sometime. In karma itself. We should continue. have another karma development. Episode? I think we should. Yeah. Okay. I think it should be like a bonus episode. If if we ever uh, your Patreon, yeah, during se- we would during uh, season it. three. We should, maybe uh, every three or four episodes we can revisit karma. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah, I think we can also, if this feels good, like people like it, tell us in the Discord, tell us in the on Twitter, tell us on. Instagram, tell us on the uh, on the eight one eight six six hey wrgs if you like this or not. I mean, we like it, so we're going to do it anyway. But tell, we like to know how yes. much you liked it, and, and this we is, also uh, might do development episodes for other stories that we come up with too. Yes, um, like agree. Salt and Pepper, so or <laughs> that would be incredible if we though if we did hit up two female black writers. That would be an amazing to, episode. To and commission. Can them we to make this work? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, what would you do to make this work here's an hour no but uh yes i i really love karma i feel like more than the the other uh project we're developing together that uh you know one of your other babies if i could call it that this one feels so much more doable and it's just amb- it's the right a level of ambition because it'd totally. be like it'd be about art building a car that was that that was convincing looking yes and then it'd be about and putting- of course doing a lot of car stuff which isn't always the easiest but most of this could probably since it's inside of the car and that's it's all about um, being inside of the car and reflection you yeah. could do it in a virtual set you could do it with yes um, I, I definitely think it would work with one of those mandalorian type not the void uh, the vo- yeah. ilms is called the void but like you know the yes yeah and how great would it be if oh. uh something on a writer's room game show years down the road was actually put into production it'd be amazing Pretty and cool. everyone could just <laughs> everyone knew what it was about because they all whoa my lights just all went on, <laughs> Hold on. you know o'clock. what that means that means it's party mode here at Seth Worley's <laughs> office. This is welcome to the writer's room game show after dark. After dark. So <laughs> do you see that lady over there in the dark? Gosh, it's like immersed in this color and then you have a lamp on in the background that's just totally killing the vibe. Oh, do I? Where is it? The white lamp there that's uh, throwing it off. It's pink, dude. Oh, pink. I got blue and pink going on. I mean, I can turn that one off if you like. Um, this is fun, Seth. Um, I'm not cutting you off because I'm tired of this. I want to keep going, but I, uh, I have to go. I do too. Uh, this was fun. Thank you all for tuning in. The Writer's Room Game Show with me, Ryan Paul, and Seth Worley. Executive produced by Grant Wakefield at Weekend Video and Ann Fogarty at Plot Devices. Edited to perfection by Renee Gomez. Our art is by your buddy, Meg Lewis, and our face-melting music by Ben Worley. The Writer's Room Game Show is a weekend video production in association with Plot Devices. Learn more about Weekend Video at weekend.video and check out writersroomgame.show to listen to all of our episodes and suggest your own prompts for future shows. And don't forget to rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts. It really helps our show out a lot. See you in the next one.